Great. So uh, I'm going to start with a content warning for an amount of nudity that I personally find uncomfortable. Um, I do think that there's no substitute for uh, seeing the works at issue. So that's what we're going to do. Um, so this is the limit case for transformativeness that ultimately produces the Warhol case. Uh, it's called Carry You versus Prince. Um, so this is one of the uh, uh, collages that were deemed by the Court of Appeals to be fair use as a matter of law. Uh, here's another. You can see the juxtaposition of the uh, photographs from Carrie Yu with uh, soft porn. Uh, the authors of that are not attributed. The women are uh, not identified. Here's another fair use as a matter of law. Um, then we also see uh, that uh, some of them are not fair use as a matter of law. So. One thing to uh, know here is that fair use can enable racial and sexual appropriation in ways that are legitimately disturbing. Uh, I would only say that works that don't rely on fair use also do the same things, uh, and it is hard to protect only good interpretations. So in Carry You, the Second Circuit holds that transformness doesn't have to have a message about or a critique of the original as long as it has a different message. Uh, the standard is objective. May a new meaning or message reasonably be perceived? Um, so one question we'll explore in class is whether the Supreme Court is also using an objective standard in Warhol and what the difference is. The Second Circuit further says that the rule is not that the artist can take no more than necessary. That's too constraining for art. So here are... Uh, uh, a couple of other photos, not fair use as a matter of law. That also needed a remand, also needed a remand. This is uh, sort of where all the images were taken from. This needed a remand. Um, so here's the naked woman uh, in this one that makes it sort of puzzling uh, why it's not uh, classed with the others that were fair use as a matter of law. Uh, in class, we can discuss what the differences might be. This one also remanded. So Carrie Yu, along with Bill Graham archives, were taken as a signal of greater openness to transform use in the Second Circuit, leading then to this backlash against transformers. It, it you know destroys the derivative works, right? Everything is transformative. Um, but even under Carrie Yu, the Second Circuit was not always finding fair use. So uh, in another case, uh, the Second Circuit found that the district court properly uh, found no fair use in a so-called sequel to J.D. Salinger's Catching Through catcher in the rye, uh, despite a parody defense by the author who had Salinger as a character meeting his creation, Holden Caulfield, uh, and making fun uh, of him. Um, so basically, the court thought, well, uh, uh, Holden Caulfield was always pretentious. And so ha having a mockery of him for that uh, doesn't actually transform the original. In another case, uh, the Second Circuit found that use of the famous who's on first comedy routine in a play was not transformative because it was intended to be funny, just like the original, even though in the play it was used uh, as a character claiming to have originated himself to show how uh, silly a character he was. So after the Colton case, uh, Richard Prince then releases Richard Prince's Catcher in the Rye. Um, yes, it's the same Richard Prince. Yes, it's the whole book with only the attribution changed. And uh, it'd be interesting to ask uh, whether uh, you think that could possibly be fair. So uh, I'm now going to talk a little bit about reverse engineering as a lead up to Google versus Oracle. Um, so Sega versus Acolyte is an important Ninth Circuit case finding fair use when the defendant copied the code of an entire game in order to extract only the code that was necessary to make the game compatible with a game playing device. So it used only that code to make a game that didn't otherwise copy the copyright owner's games. So what we had was a violation of the reproduction right in the game in order to reverse engineer the requirements of the Sega Genesis console. 
the resulting gains did not infringe. There was no violation of the distribution right or the reproduction right or anything in the gains. The issue is only the copies made in the course of preparing to deliver the end product. The games themselves did compete with uh, Sega's games. So the parties each made a basketball game, but the only expression that was copied was during the internal copying. Um, and uh, otherwise they were just two different basketball games. Possibly reverse engineering is a separate category of fair use. We could also, or instead, identify a category of fair use that is called intermediate use, which would be internal full-scale copying in order to produce for the public something that is not infringing and that is socially beneficial. Um, so the intermediate use concept links Sega to the Google big data cases, where the internal copying is also total, but the results disseminated to the public don't infringe. Um, there's also a set of cases about infringing movie scripts that says that if the final script of a movie is not infringing the plaintiff's work, the court doesn't need to go through all the intermediate drafts of the script um, to ask whether they were substantially similar to the plaintiff's work. And there's another case uh, recently saying that making a song with a sample to see if it's worth licensing the sample is also fair use if it's just done privately by the artist. So the Sega versus Accolade Court works through the four factors, purpose, is commercial, but it's indirect or derivative, what the court calls a legitimate, essentially non-exploitative purpose, producing a public benefit of growth and creative expression. Then the court jumps straight to factor four, two and three are tagalongs. The effect on the market is not harmful. Entering the market for works of the same type as the copied work isn't supplanting, it's instead legitimate indirect competition. So one important question for this view is, how do we decide what competition is legitimate? And you should see that this is, in many ways, the same question as whether one can develop a licensing market for reviews and parodies. When it gets to factor two, the court emphasizes that the nature of the work is a computer program, a new consideration, which you will also see come to center stage in Google. Uh, because it's a computer program, a competitor can't get access to the unprotectable elements, the compatibility stuff, the stuff that's functional, without copying. So just as we've seen de minimis use collapse into fair use in some cases, we also see the fact expression divide collapse into fair use in computer program cases. This is also related to the idea of publication. Before computer software, publication allowed access to ideas and non-copyrightable elements just by looking at the work. But that's not true here. So fair use has to take up the slack to protect the fact expression divide. The court limits its holding uh, to when copying is the only way to gain access to the elements necessary for interoperability. However, uh, in fact, Sega did make a license available. Um, the license's terms, however, required Sega to be the manufacturer of the games, so it got an extra cut. Apparently, that doesn't count as another way to gain access. The court must mean that if unauthorized access is available without wholesale copying, such as through visual inspection, then wholesale copying is not the only way uh, po uh, possible. So one question for you to consider is, if we assume that the licenses are not otherwise censorious or troubling, why not require Accolade to license the right to make compatible games? Sega's argument was that uh, its program, its tying, allowed it to decrease the price of consoles because it was pretty sure that you were going to buy a bunch of games. It could sell the console as a lost leader. But uh, once you make a competing console, that doesn't work anymore. Uh, the reason we don't allow this, I think, has to be that fair use is not simply about efficiency. It is about keeping copyright in its lane of protecting expression and not protecting markets. So the next case we get to is Sony versus Kinectix. This case goes a step further than Sega. So in Sony, the defendant is duplicating the operating system to create a competing operating system, not to create games that could be played on the existing console. So the defendant's product substitutes for the very copyrighted work at issue. However, it still doesn't do so by distributing uh, copied protected expression to the public. Instead, it copied only internally and extracted the unprotectable information necessary to make a non-infringing console emulator for a Windows computer. So consumers then didn't have to buy a PlayStation to play PlayStation games. 
the court finds the purpose to be modestly transformative because it's a new platform and thus a new software product, the effect on the market factor uh, does not favor Sony. Uh, Connectix is a legitimate competitor in the marketplace because what it's putting out in the marketplace is non-infringing. It does allow people to avoid buying the most expensive component of the system, which is the game playing console. But that's not a market harm because the defendant's copying enables a competing non-infringing work. Outside of the software context, uh, intermediate copying has been quite important as a concept where the copying is commercial, large scale, and involves entire works. So other than the cases we'll discuss in class, there's a case involving Ticketmaster, which held that uh, copying an entire site website to extract the price information is legitimate. However, uh, the Ninth Circuit has also held that these principles don't extend to intermediate copies made by Dish TV to implement its auto hop feature. So the Dish DVR would automatically store prime time TV and it would skip ads automatically without the user having to take any action. But Dish made a copy at its headquarters and had a human review it to make sure that auto hop had functioned successfully and detected the commercials and not missed parts of the show. This copy was held not to be fair use, in large part because Fox licensed similar copies to other providers for their own competing services uh, like Hoover. Uh, so we'll talk more about intermediate copying in class.